Hello world, GreatGizaPyramid.com. Today we're going to be looking at the Great Pyramid of Giza, located at 29.979-2458 degrees north and 31.1342 degrees east. Now you can pull this up on any one of your favorite mapping softwares, or if the video isn't clean enough, you can also go to files.greatgizapyramid.com and pull up this exact strip for cleaner viewing. Looking down upon the structure from the outside, you can see the main entrance located to the top. And below that is where uh, we, the people, enter today through a forged entrance. Up at the top of the structure, they have the rock garden. We're going to get to that. And the dimple on the other side. Now, oh, we can also see, when looking down upon it, clear demarcations of the change in elevation such that there are rings around the structure. Now that's not completely an optical illusion. You can see this picture here which was taken from the southwest side. Um, you can clearly see there are changes in the coarseness of elevation. Uh, right here they're taller, here they're smaller, here they're smaller compared to there. And this is easily seen on this map that was done up in the 1800s where somebody actually took the time to measure it and you can clearly see a sweeping pattern. Now that sweeping pattern, what it would do, is any ambient static electricity brush discharge that would fall upon the surface of this structure would be coaxed towards the top of the structure as a, and the barrier of the 35th level, which is a nice big step, and the coarseness here would, cre would uh, be a resistance factor for the static electricity to short to ground, along with other things in, on top of it, that's just, you know, one of the minor ones. So this would coax it towards the top of the structure. And because there was no top on it, it would kind of be quarantined there like a big Van de Graaff generator. Today, we've put a nice little antenna on the top of the structure, which will vent that static electricity right off the structure into the ether. Uh, so that when people do climb up there, even though you're not allowed to, you won't have your hair stand up on end. You won't get like a sense of the frizzies. But um, anyway, this is the inside of the structure. Now, this is a map done up by John Cadman. He uh, has his ideas on how to re-engineer the structure to do things. And this map is before he appended the pieces that he needs in order for it to do what, it, what he wishes it to do. Uh, my focus is on actually reverse engineering the structure and paying attention to the pieces that do exist and or that must exist logically. For instance, I do agree with much of what he says as this is the configuration of the structure, less the hole in the queen's chamber and the hole in the king's chamber, but we have photos so they don't have to be in the drawing. And I do believe the moat on the outside would go up slightly above halfway through the queen's chamber and that's because of the markings both on the outside of the structure and in the Queen's Chamber that give us a hint to the elevations. If we key up the 35th level with the ground level, you can see some uh, nice correlations between the change where, where the uh, step is at its highest, the resistance factor is at its highest, and what is occurring within the structure as to path of least resistance getting that bit of static electricity down into the system as opposed to down the outside of the system. Now here's another one. This one's totally not to scale, but you can still see correlation I, I, um, e even though it's not to scale. This is the actual entrance. This up here is this here. And this is the actual entrance that people go in today. So when people go in, they actually come through this tunnel right here into the structure so that you know Grammy doesn't slide down that descending shaft it is a pretty pretty steep shaft this is the dimple on the other side that gives us a hint to the elevations of the water on the outside and why I say it should be at a higher elevation than Mr. Cadman suggests the markings on the inside let us know the elevations of the waters on the inside and that's because when the system is working, you're going to have oxygen coming out while the water is fighting in. It's going to create a back pressure bubble, which will cause the top, like, 
fifth to third of the what they like to call the descending shaft to be a gas bubble as opposed to water. Um, the again the air would be coming out while the water is going in. I believe there's an actual configuration which is much more than just randomness. We get into that in other videos, but just for right now, all you have to picture is this section here being a big air bubble, an oxygen bubble, to be honest with you, um, such that the sediment, as the water is running down the system, would spill out and you would get this nice, clearly defined uh, waterway that was running down, down the shaft while air was coming out. This is the subterranean chamber. They like to tell you it's an unfinished room. Uh, I tell you there's nothing unfinished about it. In fact, when you pay attention and no, notice that the elevation of this elbow here lines up with uh, one of the what they like to call the fins. So does the, the top of the Y neck there match up with one of the other elevations of the fins. It's because there's communication within the structure and they communicated with re relative things, what related to what, and then within here, uh, you read it uh, north, actually this is north to south, and you also read it east to west as to how to read the structure, and this is how the structure flows. But um, you kind of read it uh, like a book, I guess. Anyway, this is a poor <laughs> rendition of it because there is a, a piece right here and the part that I was talking about, we'll see that in, another, in a photograph, which is better than the drawing. But this here gives us the scaling of the room, give you an idea of the scaling of it. Now this they like to call the dead end shaft. They have to tell you it's nice and squared. I want to point out that it is not squared, it's ribbed, kind of like an inchworm. And that comes more into play when we focus on the function. And here's where Mr. Cadman really should pay attention. His expertise with thermal, with uh, hydrodynamics, would account for why there are sediment in the way they are lining up with the, the rings here. I believe there was a function happening within the structure, but uh, we'll worry about that later. Here are the elevations I was talking about within within the area. You can clearly see there are steps there and those line up with the elevations within that elbow piece. Um, and when you look at the entire thing it's well when you understand what is occurring and then you can see what elevations align up with it this is where this structure will hopefully eventually be like the Rosetta Stone to reading monolithic structures where Carl came up with the his matrix, this would be the application of his matrix and actually getting function out of it. This is a hole in the back wall that goes up there. There's a bubble that goes up a couple of feet. It does not go to anywhere. It just is a bubble for capturing the gas. And um, that, that gas, well, it's in the back side of here my back would be to it in this side of the picture and in this picture he's at, he was actually standing here looking up into it there so I just give you an idea where it is when I refer to it in my other videos if this gentleman was to turn around and look down this hallway he'd see this this rock there that is one of the three granite rocks in the lower section of the pyramid the subterranean chambers um, they all come into play. In fact, this one you can actually see the scarring of the reaction on the wall. In fact, we can see it a little bit more here. Right now in this video series, I'm going to point out down in the pit on that shelf, this would be uh, the what I like to refer to as the A rock, the anode rock. That other rock that we were just looking at, this one right here, this one is an intermediary rock, um, and the actual cathode is located within the subtraining or sorry the uh, grotto section we'll get to that in just one moment you can see here this is the same picture from before it, it was located against this wall today we have located it against this wall we rolled it over there when they did roll it you can see here the scarring against the wall 
where it was prior to them rolling it. Now, the nice thing about this is that shows us that it actually had some function. I'm going to tell you that was off venting in this particular case hydrogen off of that rock because of the way the whole room is shaped. You also look at how it's smooth here and then rippled. You can see it in both of these pictures, smooth and then rippled. This would allow for the water hammer that Mr. Cadman finds where when the oxygen would create a bubble here and then bubble over that edge would create a water hammer which left this sediment right here along the side left it in a nice pattern you see in both of these photos and these are two actual different photos even though they're of the same area we have since cleaned that dirt out so you can't even find the um, markings of that but it is clearly there in these pictures before they did a lot of things that's why these older pictures are so so convenient to have because they do back up the story with evidence physical evidence that water would blur below over the edge and would cause roughness here as years of slapping that water back and against the edge where here it's all smooth this is at a higher elevation here it's not very smooth because every time that water that air bubble popped over the edge creating that water hammer it would um, leave some scarring anyway the water that would be running down that channel would actually be broken when it hits this rock. This rock has since been removed, make it easier for us to give tourism, but in its day that would break the water coming down so it would pool instead of flowing down the system. And hence this right here you can clearly see this is underwater level. That's why this water is kind of settled there. You don't see the strip down the center. This is the entrance. The elevation of this keys in with the elevation of the uh, main subterranean chamber room. It, it's because they're, they're communicating with you if you care to read. This area we've filled in. People can't go down there and climb up. And in fact, it would be nice since they want to send a blimp up into the area of the structure where they found low density. Why don't they send a blimp up into the grotto area and get us nice pictures of that hallway and everything that we do know exists and doesn't have to be broken into. Get us some real pictures so we can actually map this thing out um, even better. The grotto is located up here. No one visits that because you can't climb down here and they're not going to let you climb up there. It's, it's kind of dangerous. This is why we should send the blimp up there. You know what I mean? But when people had gone in there, they were nice enough to map it out. This is the, the uh, cathode I was talking about. This room is set up in such a way that you have air pressure bubbles both so the water, when it comes in, cannot fill above a certain spot, and so that the gases within are caused to separate uh, so that you get a, a clear separation between the hydrogen and the oxygen that comes out below. These are actual photos from the room. Again, these are from a long while ago, back when they used to let you climb up into the structure. Uh, well, maybe with a bunch of bribing, but today they don't let you. In fact, today we don't have to. We can send a drone up there. And it would be really nice for us to get really nice pictures of this um, so we can really map out exactly how this room is configured and actually put it through some tests to confirm functionality uh, instead of just guessing. This particular person who uh, made this up felt the water level was a little bit lower. Well, since the water would be under pressure when it comes into the room, the water level would fill up to the highest point uh, of entry into the room. So the water level should be above that part. It, it should be at a higher elevation. This should be completely saturated. This would be the King's Chamber. Um, I focus on these pictures because I want to point out the elevation score mark right here. This particular elevation goes across the top of the, the uh, box in the room. It goes around the room. It goes in the thieves tunnel which they don't show here it's a tunnel that digs down here between two and here and we have photos of it so I'm, I'm not making it up it's a part that exists it's off the map they don't in include it because it's not part of the tomb theory but it is part of the physical structure so why do they ignore it well because it's not part of the tomb theory here we have the actual king's chamber and you can see the score mark I was looking uh, talking about it completely goes around the entire circumference 
It's at the same elevation as the box in the room. Comes around right here. This particular opening is just below the score mark. This one actually hurdles it. We'll get better pictures of that in a moment. This is taken so you can't really see it, but it, it is at this elevation. This is just from a higher elevation in the box so you don't see it. These right back here are actual metal. They're, they're metal that are made to look like the rock. You don't have to really totally believe me. Here they are when they were grates before they were fabricated to look like the rock. You can see the grates here in the background. This is a picture looking over at the um, southern shaft out of the king's chamber. Here is the hole that is actually underneath that. These pictures are from, like you can see here, the late 70s before they covered it over the grate. They had wood over it. And this is a picture down underneath it. This picture, from what I understand, is in the 90s. This is when they had the grate over it, you know, before it was the simulated floor. There is looking down into it. You see it's about 10 feet deep. Um, and there is brickwork down there. There's also brickwork along the back wall there. Uh, originally, I thought the brickwork was aftermarket, something we had done more current day. But when you look at uh, some of the exterior to the pyramid, there are and is brickwork on the exterior. Here is the uh, score mark. You see it came down across here and back in. This is the opening that goes out, uh, the only area that actually breaches the surface of the structure. In fact, that opening here is the score mark would be <clears throat> about uh, four-fifths of the way up, leaving just the beveled portion over if we were to fill the room with water to cap that off. And here, that would cap it off right here. This is the it's oval immediately behind it, and then it squares out. This is actually the shape that you saw right here. It's, it's kind of like a catcher's mitt shape. Whoever drew this decided to draw it like that, <clears throat> but that's not accurate because, well, it's just not accurate. This is the door that we'll be talking about in a few minutes, and it is uh, on the same elevation as these. In fact, it's this is down the hallway from the king's chamber right down here. We'll get to that in a minute. This is the southern shaft, the only one that opens to the exterior of the structure. And uh, the other sides, there there are no openings. They don't exist. Can't give you a picture of what doesn't exist. So if we were going down this hallway and turn to the left before we got out there, in this spot right here where they don't show anything, but physical pictures do, they show this little door that they've covered. Nowadays, it's currently a grate. This picture was taken within that hallway looking out. And if, if this guy would look to the left, I think it's actually the same guy, that's where the entrance is, right, where the the score mark is in the ground right here the score mark there's the entrance right there to the side down that hallway you see a nice uh, this is right here the elevation that same score mark so this conduit is right above it now what's really important about this picture <clears throat> is this gentleman's holding a little mirror and someone from the king's chamber shined one of those two million candle watt flashlights in there down this shaft and they were able to see the light within that conduit it tells you that these conduits are connected so it goes up uh, where do I have a better picture dun, dun, dun. oh well I don't <laughs> oh, I don't anyway it went up and uh, comes it connects to there. That's important when we look at the functionality of it. <clears throat> now here against this wall, they were nice enough to, in this drawing, make it look like a nice solid shape. In reality, it was not a solid shape. Just like the top of the Grand Gallery was, is not a step. It was not a step. It was a funnel. They've patched it over nowadays, so you can see it's all patched over. But back in the day, it actually had, I'm not going to say a chip out of it, in fact, I think if we were to look at that, the pattern there would mean more to us if we looked at it on, on the level of frequencies and, and uh, 
like the per disbursement statistics, like uh, uh, like the double split, split experiment type stuff. The boss mark, they love to give you false information about it. One thing that is true is the boss mark itself is slightly over, closer to the east. Even on here it does show that. But they like to show it as a, as a nice flat top. Here they show it as an oval top. In reality, it comes across and about, uh, I'd say, three-eighths of the way across, then it starts to come down. Better picture of it here. And the boss mark sits about here on the other side. And, ironically enough, you can see a little marking there of where I believe something was sitting behind it. Uh, that is part of the structure that was removed when they broke through there. But uh, we'll get back into that when we recreate it. That's one of the areas that we're given some license to fabricate, fabricate some of the structure, being that we did destroy it when we entered. This is the funnel I was talking about. Uh, we've hence capped it over, so now it's a nice step. You see there, we've made it a step. Put ladders in there for tourism. But prior to that, it was a funnel, and they didn't want Granny sliding down there and down the Grand Gallery and suing anybody. They've also patched off a bunch of this damage here, which shows some wear and tear, uh, gives credence to what was occurring, but um, we'll worry about that later when we discuss the functionality of what was going on. And then you can turn around and say, like, oh, now I understand why there was damage there. We'll worry about that later also. All right now I just want you to see it, visualize it, know what it, it did and does exist. So when I refer to it later, you do you can say, oh yeah, I remember him pointing that out. This is the Grand Gallery itself, vaulted ceilings, very unique configuration. Uh, something to take in mind. Also take into mind how it how each one relates to each other as to where the center is compared to where the end is, etc. etc. Um, that would come more when you relate it to the code by Carl Monk and you understand how everything is relational data. Everything corresponds to something and that's how you read the entire structure. They even got uh, vaulted ceilings on here so that the drip pattern would be all throughout there. It's a very, very uh, unique setup. This step wasn't there. That wasn't aftermarket they stuck in there. In fact, I'm not even sure it's there today. But you can see the watermarks along the side here. You can say they're whatever, but they're way too consistent throughout the entire structure to be anything other than watermarks. And it shows the water level, and I'm going to tell you it pairs up with the squiggle mark I showed you on the outside. Today we have it covered over with a wood thing. Prior to that it was covered over with a fence. Um, there are important things, like there's a little ridge here that this covers over that would keep the water here and make it spill down into the spillway. It would come across here, hit that little dam and spill down. So as the system was coming to play, water wouldn't actually go down that conduit. In fact, uh, in some cases I think there's a separation of types of water and it still is designed not to go down that conduit. But that's uh, later when we get into the functionality. Here's the dam I was talking about, seen in both of these sketches. I'd like to get real pictures of this. It would be much better than the sketches. I believe I know how the configuration is, both based on the sketches and my understanding of pieces of the system. However, it would be much easier if we could actually get um, some real photographs of that area and or get the uh, find the blueprints within the Nazca lines on the Giza platform on the Nazca Plateau. Uh, you can go to blueprints.greatgizapyramid.com for more information on that. This is how this is current day. We've patched over the hole in the floor. I say hole, but it was that way intentionally. It was a soft spot, so we could get below it to actually uh, get more information out of it, just like how there's information within the niches here and within the, the tail of the tail of it there, paying attention to where each surface ends and what it connect it, it pairs with. The communication is all over within it if you're willing to look for it. Just you have to be willing to actually be looking for communication. 
This, while it says north, is actually, the arrow is correct, it's to the south. This is the north where the entrance is. This is the south where the dimple is. This is the south side. This would actually, at the time when we first found it, it had this electrical arcing mark within it. And what we did is we drilled a hole through the electrical arcing to find the conduit behind it. And then they sought out and found the conduit for the other side and drilled through and opened that one up as well. Uh, prior to that, this supposedly, there was no visual signs that there was a conduit behind it. And this, the only way they knew is because there was the electrical arcing on the side. That is where the uh, electricity was actually extracted from the room. The, the static electricity from the surface of the structure brought down into the room. And down here, a drop of condensation, all the other condensation in the room didn't matter. One drop of condensation here would run down, hit these veins, come across, and fall down. And when it got about here, in midair, is when the magical spark of, of energy would occur. And it would be given the path of least resistance and the path of lesser travel. And it would work its way to the northern shaft, sorry, southern shaft, which is this side northern shaft is that side. The northern shaft was the control. That one didn't get as much play. When they found the room, they found it with dirt on the floor and with the tail filled in. That's because that's communication. It did not need to be exposed, just like the fins in the subterranean chamber. They were covered with rock when it was first found. Just like the uh, squiggle marks and stuff at the main entrance, covered with rocks when they first found it. This communication was covered because they wanted the communication to be safe from reactions within the rock or within the structure, so they were covered. They figured when you unburied it, you'll get the information. When you understand how to read it, you understand how to read it. Until then, it's going to stay covered and be safe. But when you look into there, you can see how certain things line up with certain teeth. The other side lines up with other teeth. These all have to deal with the elevations of the flooring and what lines up with what. Uh, it's it's very, very easy to see. Even this split in half, that one drip that would fall, that would fall, would come down and would fall into that. That was like the, the glory hole drip right there. That drip, when it was released, oh, you can even see the water, water line around the edge here. When that drip was released, it would have the path of least resistance to this conduit as opposed to that conduit. This conduit is six inches closer because of the way the, the whole niche is designed. That is not only six inches closer east to west, it's, six, it's closer north to south because the niche itself is off center. The whole structure, this right here shows the glory hole, that, that spot. Any drip that happens to be hovered in the air within from here to here, it has the statistical chance of going to this side. If it's further over, it might statistically go to that side or fizzle out. That, that might be like a no-go area because the, it can't even get there because that, that's where there's wall. So it's really looking for the drip zone to be right here. If it's over here, maybe it doesn't have the energy it needs. It, it needs to be where that drip itself has the decision on where to release its energy and you give it the path of least resistance. The whole system does. Anyway, that pretty much sums it up. Um, I go into great detail on all this. You're welcome to try to question me. You're welcome to have me cite, you know, laws of physics and examples of it, all the system, but it all plays together to be one big system. Now, this is just one piece. This is just one piece of the entire plateau because all three of the pieces all three of the pyramids, in fact, even the worker pyramids, they all fit together. They're one large system. And I detail that in some of my other videos. And I hope I've conjured up enough curiosity that you check out some of my other videos and look at this as the system it is. Don't, there's, there's nothing about this that says tomb. Nothing. Nothing except for stories. And I'll tell you that those stories are, are so, so far fabricated they don't even hold water. Anyway. Thank you for viewing. Have a nice day.